Hey, welcome back to It's a Miracle Budgeting. Different viewpoint today. Today is the first episode of my credit series. I'm gonna talk about what is credit? How do you repair credit? How do you gain credit um, start to finish? So the first episode of today is what is credit? How are you rated on it? What are they looking at? What's happening? So this is a different place than I normally film. This is my living room. In case you haven't seen any of my previous videos, I actually live in a ancient, ancient trailer. <laughs> it's actually older than my husband and I. However, we paid about $5,300 for it and it is the only reason we've been able to pay off debt prior to, you know, the global thing that happened and the things happening right now in Ukraine and the just inflation that's happening. Even prior to Ukraine, we were seeing high inflation. Prior to all of that, rental rates in my area skyrocketed. I live in one of the richest counties in the United States, definitely the richest in uh, Michigan. And unfortunately, it's a very big dichotomy between the haves and the have nots. So like in my school district, we live in a trailer park. We live in a manufactured home park. And about, let me see, one, two, three, three to five miles from my house is billionaire row and it, they're not joking these homes are hundred billion dollar homes um any of the big execs that live in the area musicians things like that all live in that range it's literally where my kids go to school that is the middle school and high school that those kids go to they drive mercedes 2022 they all have jeeps they all have very nice vehicles and whereas we drive older vehicles we, we actually are wealthy for our neighborhood and we're not wealthy like let me just put that out there i'm not flexing we are not wealthy but for our area it is a very big thing that in this neighborhood it is a survival it is striving to get each meal striving to pay the bills every month exactly where we were 10 years ago and really even five years ago but I preface to say five years ago was our own fault. It was not the economy, it wasn't our income, it was because of spending. But 10 years ago and prior, we had six young children that we were trying to raise. We did not make good money. Um, we went on and off federal benefits at different times, depending on our job, depending on the hours we could get. We often had more than one job, either or both of us. So it's just a different situation. So in my county, housing is a struggle housing rent at my previous place and i actually rented a brand new manufactured home when we got it it was a four bedroom um 2000 square foot two bath huge kitchen island open concept the whole deal it was actually more of a piece of crap than this one because it wasn't built the same way years ago they were built to last but i digress um we paid with the year we moved in that home we paid 999 per month which is very reasonable, but it's because it was a manufactured home. An apartment wouldn't be that much. Um, the year we moved out, they were trying to raise my rent to $2,000. We lived there approximately seven years. That's how much rents had jumped that they could get that. Another example of how much housing has jumped in my area, and I'm sure you're all seeing this as well, it's not just to my area, is that the trailer we moved into has a sister trailer that's like right two houses from us, like across the street and behind them. And um, the family that lived there was actually an employee of our park who just trashed, they trashed the trailer, they trashed the yard. I mean, it was in really bad shape when the um, trailer park actually bought it off them. And our trailer, we bought again, it was, I think it was 5,600 with taxes and everything all in it and it being about 6,000 and something. They sold that trailer for $20,000. So if that gives you a perspective from 2018 to 2021, that's how much housing changed during this whole international event. So it's credit is more important now than it's probably ever been. And I hate saying that and making it sound dramatic, but we have people out here like Dave Ramsey and, and there's quite a few others that say pay cash for everything. You never need credit. Close all your credit cards, which is like the worst advice ever. And they act at they make it sound like it is an option to just use cash. Like we have the average home in my city and my school district starts at 400K. Starts at, that's not even like the, that's not even like a walk-in ready key change type of situation, key holder thing. This is, or what do they call that? Key, turnkey. It's not even a turnkey. I'll get it right one of these days. Um, it's not even turnkey. That means it probably has a 1960s kitchen. That means it probably has a, you know, monochrome, monochrome um, P90 
pink bathroom, which I actually love those because my grandparents had that. But the point is, is that's not a fixer upper. That is where they start pretty much. Now you will see ones lower within my city that is in the other schools. So we go to the, the creme de la creme high school, which I wouldn't have chosen to be honest. Great staff, not to staff. The kids don't understand the have nots and we've had issues with that. But the other high schools are all very even kill on income, even kill on housing, even kill on everything. It would have been easier. So if I wanted to buy a house in my subdivision, or not my subdivision, but my area, I would need to have $400,000 in cash if I didn't have credit. I mean, that just is ludicrous. Most people in a normal everyday income don't have that unless they save for 30 years and then they're already retired and wouldn't want a big house anyways. So it's kind of the big thing. So that was a lot of information up front about my area, my zone, but I want to kind of let, let you know where I'm coming from and let you know what exactly is the basis for some of what I say. So the natural light that I'm sitting next to may change a little bit. It's actually midday. It's like 1.15. However, it snowed last night and it's now warming up. And as the snow melts, my neighbor's house literally like will reflect more or less because the snow, the, the sun is like hitting their roof and shining into my house. So I apologize if the light changes, but it's one of those things that unless I set up an artificial light, which I personally don't like, I don't want to, you know, just leave it as if I didn't notice and didn't say anything. So the first thing I want to say before I get into anything about credit scores or what the basics of credit are is this is re in regards to U.S. credit, United States. I cannot comment on Canadian, UK, anywhere else in the world. I know from friends and family tidbits of things. I know tidbits about when you come here and you have a, it was a called a TIN number, I think. I don't know enough to ever give advice on that or anything. And the advice I'm going to give in this episode is, or in all of my episodes across my entire channel, is from my perspective as a consumer. I am not a financial manager. I am a licensed insurance agent, so I am in finance, but I've never had, you know, I've had finance classes and accounting because I'm an insurance agent, but I, I'm not an expert and I don't pretend to be. And so everything in this is advice that you can use if you choose to, but it's just stating what I've done and explaining the facts of credit, okay? So U.S. scores, the only thing we're talking about here, it may be similar to other areas and you may be able to take information out of this, but I do understand if my international folks skip this series and are like, you know, I'm out. The other thing I want to talk about really early in this episode is FICO versus FACO. A lot of people that are really into the credit world and there's something called the credit ladder, which I will talk about in a later, much later episode, they talk often about how FACOs don't matter, that FACOs are nothing but basically a magic eight ball and you could get a totally good number that's dead on your FICO or you could get a totally bad number. So FICO is the most accepted and represented real credit score. It's not a FACO, it's a scoring system that was created by the FICO um, company and it typically has different versions. So there's like a FICO 5, FICO 6, FICO 7, FICO 8, FICO everything. So lenders use different ones, but typically they don't ever use the newest one. So typically FICO uses, or lenders use FICOs that have been around and kind of trued and tested for a little while. And so there's a lot of different options and depending on where you pull your FICO from, you may be able to see the different variations. So they're accepted by banks. They're accepted by a lot of different um, lenders as well as in the credit industry, in the banking industry, it's considered one of the only, not the only, but one of the only true dead set credit scores, okay? So the analogy that I gave to my kids is if, if you've ever done DNA testing, like Ancestry, 23andMe, whatever, Whatever you put in, like the DNA itself, what you see as the result varies by their, their standards, right? It varies by their testing population. It varies by what weight they place on what. So I personally have my DNA at both of them and it's completely different. So back to the FACO and the FICO is different scores are different, not because your information actually is different, it's their scoring model is different. Their testing um, requirements are different, things like that. So it's really important that, and I and this is kind of gobbledygook and boring I get, but in order to check your credit, you gotta understand what you're looking at. So one of the biggest FACO scores that are out there that people initially try to use and look at as fact is Credit Karma, which I actually like Credit Karma. I think they're great. I think it's nice to kind of monitor your credit, but don't think of it as a factual monitoring because it's not. Like point blank, it is a hint as to what your credit might be. There 
credit reports are not 100% accurate compared if you go pull it from the source. But they give you a little bit of thing, but it's also great for monitoring for bad things. So if someone tries to open a credit card in your name, things like that. So I really strongly recommend everyone register with them. It's free. It's I'm not being sponsored. They don't even know I exist. It's just a nice little backup, but don't look at those scores as the facts. Think of it as, okay, that maybe is a guidance or it might be garbage, not really sure. I never put stock in those scores. So next, um, I wanna talk about what is the components of a good score. So credit scores range from, typically on most scoring standards, 300 to 850. So that, and I'm looking at notes in case, you know, I wonder why I look down, but I don't have all of this memorized because my brain is not that powerful or my memory isn't anyways. So very poor is considered 300 to 499. 500 to 600 is poor, 600 to 660 is fair, which is funny because if you look, it went from being almost 200 and then almost 100 and then all of a sudden it's 50, 59 points. And then next is 661 to 780 is good and then 780 to 850 is very good. Now, that being said, you will see these vary across the board. You will see that at times they, it will say that actually you need to be over 750 to be good. I mean, it's very, but these are a loose guideline that I pulled from a couple different websites so you could understand. Um, 35% of your credit score, good or bad, is actually your um, payment history. This is if you've ever had late pays, do you pay on time? Do you have charge offs? Do you have collections? Things like that. 30% of your credit score is actually the amount owed. Typically, this is vast majority applies to your revolving credit. That would be credit cards, things that you have a set limit you can spend up to and pay down from. Not a personal loan, car loan, house loan, student loan that has a set amount and you just pay it off. They was are in that number, but they're a much less substantiated or uh, substantial amount. They actually revolving is the predominant value they're looking at because they look at it as if you have a personal loan, and this is just a really loose explanation of this, but if you have a personal loan, let's say, better yet, scratch that, let's do a car loan. You get a six year car loan, which now we're looking at six, seven, and eight years now. When I got my cars when I was younger, we weren't allowed to go over five. It was in fact, they kind of shamed you when you did five. And now, just to be able to afford the 40% increase in cars, they're allowing six, seven, eight years. So, let's say you have a six year car loan. Most people either put it on auto pay or pay that one month each month at a time. And they kind of set it and forget it. They don't really think about it. A lot of people don't pay them off early, especially if it's a good interest rate. They're like, forget it. I like having my money. And so, the credit reporting companies, as well as the financial industry, don't really look at. Re at um, loan debt the same as they look at personal revolving debt okay so then if we keep looking at the credit mix 15% is the length of your credit history so this is actually your oldest and your newest average but it's not just those two it's everything in between so if one year you seek a ton of credit and you have a ton of new accounts your score will dip because you got tons of new credit it lowered your average age but likewise, if you do it every so often and you only get a couple, you're having like spots of credit increase or um, the number of accounts and new accounts, your average age will actually be longer. And so it's a, that's one of the reasons why they tell you not to go get tons of new credit all at once. It lowers your average age. And then it also is how often you pull credit is worth 10%. So your uh, inquiries, and it's usually one year roughly, it affects you, it's not your credit score for two years, but usually after the first year, they really don't look at it much unless it's excessive. And then um, the other thing is your credit mix, which this is one I, I, I don't wanna negate that they count it, but it's probably less than 10% in my opinion. I probably on one hand could count how many times I had a bank say, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Miracle or Mrs. Miracle, you are getting denied because you don't have a good credit mix. I actually know of one bank that has done that and it's Chase Bank and they want you to have a mortgage because they want, if you go to bankruptcy, to have to pull out of your, um, you know, your investment to pay them back. And if you don't have a house, they don't have anywhere to go. Chase is notorious for that. Let's make them a bad bank and make some smart business people, but that is why they do that. Credit mix is not very important to everyone else. Um, in my experience, I've never had someone other than Chase Bank say, sorry, you've never had a home loan. We can't work with you. They usually don't care. So my ex experience with credit, and I'm gonna try to shorten this as much as I can because majority of this part I'm gonna cover in my credit rebuilding. Um, my mother has some significant issues in her past and she was a shopaholic. She 
claim bankruptcy more than one time. Now, mind you, my mom is not dumb. My mom is very smart. And um, while we do not have a relationship due to her issues, um, I do respect the fact that one, she had a rough life. She was a single mom. My dad died when I was a baby. She did not have, she had help from my grandparents, but she didn't have ever be in the world helping her out, right? And she had to go to work when I was six weeks old because my dad died. She didn't have a choice. So I definitely think that um, her issues, whether I'm not a psychologist, I don't know exactly what she's diagnosed with. That's her business, not mine. But there were some things I noticed in my youth that she constantly had maxed out credit cards. She never asked us to save money, never taught us to save money other than when she wanted to prove a point. And so when I turned 18, my mom had credit cards and I immediately went and got every credit card at the mall that I could think of that I would like. Then the bills came and I went, oh sh shit. I mean, I actually, it, it almost felt like dream money. It didn't feel like it was real money. So initially for the first two years that I had credit, I did pay my bills on time. Initially, I paid the minimum on every card for two years. And then, and not even quite two years, it was actually about 18 months. And then I got pregnant with my son. Um, the summer I turned 19, I got pregnant with my oldest son and I had um, morning sickness so bad that I literally couldn't work. I literally couldn't leave my bed some days. And so there was no way for me to continue these credit cards and I sure was not gonna go to my mother or family members and his dad was not in the picture to say, hey, help me with this. So they defaulted and they went to collections. I didn't even realize what that meant, didn't understand, didn't really care at that point. I had bigger fish to fry at 19 and pregnant. So I never really thought about those cards again until I was in my early 20s. I had met my husband at this point. I don't think our first son together was born yet, but we were going down that path. We were, you know, planning to have more kids. We were planning to get married, the whole deal. And we went to get an apartment and we applied for that apartment. The lady basically laughed me out of the office. Like basically, it was humiliating. It was, it was traumatizing. And she didn't have a right to be that rude, but I didn't have any concept on the credit and how long it lasted. And that stuff was actually in theory really fresh. It was less than or about two years old, maybe three years old. So in her mind, she's like, why are you even paying money to apply for this apartment if you know you can't get it? So we, my husband didn't really have bad credit at the point. I think he had one collection from when he was in the military and it really wasn't even his fault. He left 29 Palms and the people never even tried to contact him, never did anything. And he had a change of address. They could have found him. They, they never even tried. They just put on his credit report. But um, I basically just pretended it didn't exist and didn't want to address it until I was about 23 or 24. I actually got sued right before the expiration date of debt in the state of Michigan. And I'm going to cover expiration dates of debt the reporting clauses and things like that in my credit rebuilding. So I'm just giving you a short summary of what mine was. I got sued and I actually had a really cool coworker who said, do you even understand all this? And I said, no, I have no idea what's even happening here. And mind you, the internet exists at this point, but it wasn't as good as it is now. So I'm 43, we had internet in my twenties. We had it kind of on our phones. It wasn't the best on our phones, but we definitely had access. But there wasn't a lot of sites. I found one site at her suggestion called Credit Boards. And I recommend anyone who's got credit repair issues to check their site out. It is a message board. They have pretty much anything you can ask and they've been in the credit game for 30 plus years. They all understand it. Majority of the owners of the site actually have hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit. Most of them pay no credit or no interest on their um, car loans and things like that. So it's pretty neat, the resources there. But she pointed me there. I used that site and I actually got every single negative deleted off my credit. And by the time I was 25, I actually had bomb credit. And I mean, like to be 25 and have a seven, 800 score, $100,000 in available credit, not used credit, available, was not heard of at this time. My friends were like, how did you even do that? And I said, I just filed this stuff on this. I kind of was naive about that even, filed this on this website. But I didn't know I didn't want to max out our cards. I didn't want to have all this debt. So we had approximately 5,000 in debt, most of them on zero interest cards. Navy Federal was our main creditor and economic decline happened. And when the economic decline happened, our car loan was with Navy Federal and I got, I lost my job. I worked in finance. So when the economic decline hit hard, finance industry was one of the hardest hit and I lost my job. I was laid off. Um, my husband maintained his work the entire time. He actually worked for as a security supervisor for the big three. He maintained his position the entire time. But we went from two okay incomes to one okay income, which is dramatic when you have a family of six. So one of the biggest, actually that might have been five at the time. I think my son was born at the end of that. But um, 
they started garnishing our car payment out of our checking account and so that we couldn't pay rent we couldn't buy food for our family we couldn't do anything and i went to one of my former bosses and i said what would you do i said i have a hundred thousand dollars available credit tomorrow i could go pull out enough cash to cushion my account and i could float Pe rob and peter to pay paul for the next 10 years if i needed to i go but i don't want to do that at the end of the day i'm still gonna have to pay all that back so i don't want to do that so what do you advise and he said i would claim bankruptcy and i said but I only owe 5000 He goes, I understand that. He goes, but that will stop their collection efforts. They have to stop the minute you file bankruptcy and you're young. You're only 25. If you do it now, you'll be done by the time you're 35. It'll be after credit report, he said. So, and if you play your cards right and you do things well, you actually won't have bad credit for that full 10 years. And I said, yeah, I don't think I want to do that. And I waited about another 30 days and then my son had a field trip that was due. He had a $65 field trip that would only be paid by a check. And I had left this money in one of my accounts that I thought was untouchable. And I didn't realize that court documents had been filed to seize my bank accounts so that they could not be used. And so I had to let my little boy know when he was young, he was in elementary school, that he couldn't go on that field trip that day. And that was very emotional for me and very shameful. It was worse than not being able to buy food. We could use a credit card to buy groceries. We could make it work. Our kids didn't really know, but he knew. And so we did end up filing bankruptcy. We actually, um, <laughs> I laugh because it's comical looking back now because I didn't realize the whole world was filing bankruptcy at this point. I had no idea. And um, the judge looked at us and said, do you want to do this? You only have $5,000 in debt plus 5,000 on a car or maybe it was 8,000 on the car. He said, and, and you know, you just, you didn't use a lot are you sure you don't want to wait and i said i looked at the lawyer for navy federal who was in the room with us and i said no they will not stop taking my baby's food money i said i have to my babies have to come first and it's really important to me that i can provide for them at any point in time in our lives and he said okay he's like i just want to make sure he goes you're gonna see as you sit in this court and wait for your your final numbers and everything to be called he said you're gonna hear of people that don't do it this way and I said, I can sleep at night with this. I feel like I've tried my best and I've honored my ethical, you know, requirements and I can live like this. He said, okay, he goes, so um, your case technically is not getting called because he had called us up front before our case was ready. He said, you guys are not getting called for another hour. So there's quite a few people in front of you. So I apologize you have to wait. He's like, but I just want to ask you that before you waited the whole time. I said, okay. I had no idea what he meant. I didn't understand what he meant. Every single person or couple that got up there that filed bankruptcy actually had spent everything available to them. They had went to Macy's and maxed out their cards. They had went to these lavish vacations at Cancun. They had done all these things and maxed everything out because they knew they were going to file bankruptcy. And honestly, I'm not judging. That's for someone else to judge, but that wasn't right to me. And so that's why I hadn't done that. Well, and if I'm fully transparent, I never thought of doing that. It never even hit my brain. Actually, afterward, we're like, we should have bought a shit ton of diapers before <laughs> we did that. So it kind of never hit my brain to even do it, to be honest. But I tell you all this, and even though I hate I get emotional about it still at this point, um, I tell you this because bankruptcy is an option when it's needed. I don't believe in using it as a budgetary convenience. But if you have life or death, it's okay to do that. So I had again screwed up my credit. That's two times in less than 10 years. And I had a lot of shame around credit. I, my mom would ask me things or my in-laws would ask me things that I would just be like, oh, I don't remember. I don't know. I'm not sure. I would never give answers because I was ashamed that I was an adult. Now, older and wiser, Brandy looks back and goes, were you really an adult at 25? Yeah, the law says you're an adult, but at 25, not everyone has the same maturity level. And I think with no financial education in this country, that's one of the things that gets left. So I initially shied away from credit for a really long time. I was worried that I didn't have the mental capacity, the responsibility and everything, and I would rather have my kids' bills paid. So for a really long time, I was a stay-at-home mom. I actually had my own business. I actually owned a cloth diaper store and natural parenting, and I was a doula. And I lived cash even though I didn't know cash budgeting then, I did live cash. I paid cash for a lot of things. I would save money for things. And we went without for a lot of things, to be quite honest. We lived a very meager living. In fact, my kids almost refer to it like the dark years because <laughs> we went from um, having 
okay money and buying toys and spoiling them and having big Christmases to having really meager Christmases and getting a little bit each which now it's kind of cute because they're programmed and they don't expect huge Christmases and so they're excited and appreciate what they get whereas when they had those big Christmases they just looked at it as stuff so it has actually benefited us but it is so that is why I say it's really important to learn about credit and to be willing to invest yourself in the learning about credit. Don't let everybody tell you what to do and how to do it. Learn the skills, learn the history and everything else. So that's my credit experience with the exception of the last 10-ish years, not even 10 years, seven, eight years. And I'll get more into that later on. I think that's it for this episode. Um, I would love if you guys would put questions down below that I can answer in future episodes so it can be in something I touched on in this video that maybe I didn't explain clearly or you have further questions on. It could be something I didn't cover yet in this video because this is a series that I'm going to be doing um, somewhat irregularly. I'll be very honest. Um, like right now when I'm filming, my entire family, my older son that just moved back in temporarily, he's at work. The rest of the my husband and the three other boys are actually going to watch Batman, which is a three hour movie gave me plenty of time to do these things. My house is not quiet. When I film my budgeting videos, I literally have to have everyone do everything they need at the back of the house. That's where the bathroom is. And then get out of, and stay out of the way. And I actually have to have them keep their voices down because our house is a small house. So to film, it's very difficult to film like this. First of all, I couldn't even be in the living room. That That's a joke. But second of all, um, it's not something that I can have just talking and interacting on a regular basis without pre-planning. That being said, my family are movie fanatics and springtime typically going into the summer is like the big time for the movies. So I'm hoping that these will be regular, that this won't be like every Saturday at noon, which is kind of a joke anyways because none of my videos are like that if we're really being frank. But post in this um in either in the comments or you can post on the community tab i'll open a tab up for that you guys can post questions you can make comments tell your experiences with credit good bad or ugly give your opinions if you disagree with me show me tell me i as long as you're respectful i welcome countering points i love discussing them i love talking about them um i personally have changed how i do my finances budget credit everything probably a thousand times over my 43 years or you know since 18 to 43 because it just depended if, if i watch somebody else do something new and i'm like but that is cool that's gonna work for me i took where has that been my whole life I love hearing countering points. The only thing I ask is that you're respectful to me and other people. I do block people for disrespect and trolling. I don't think there's any reason to be a keyboard warrior and bash someone on the internet. That's just my take and my opinion and that's where I'm at. So if you made it this far, I hope that you will like, share, subscribe. Make sure you ring the bell for notifications. As I discussed earlier, there will be no regular schedule to this and so you'll want to be notified when I do upload. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope your budget's going good and I hope I see you soon. Bye guys. Have a great weekend.